Now, one year into the war in Ukraine, we take a look at the key battles that have defined the course of the conflict. Let's start at the beginning, the Battle of Kiev. Russia had planned to take the capital in one multi-pronged offensive. Sorties of planes attacked from the air, while tanks and paratroopers advanced on the ground, seeking to surround the capital. But Ukrainians resisted, employing guerrilla warfare to ambush the Russians, who also suffered from logistical problems. An armoured column running out of fuel, a farcical demonstration of Moscow's early disorganisation. While Russia withdrew from the Kiev region 33 days later, Ukraine's unexpected success had robbed Russia of a swift victory. It also exposed the poor coordination among Russia's armed forces. After failing to seize Kyiv, Russia fell back and shifted its gaze to the eastern Donbass region. Mariupol, a port city on the Black Sea, became one of the first cities to be destroyed by relentless artillery bombardment. Around 90 percent of the city was blasted to pieces. Ukrainian forces were beaten back to the huge Azovstal steel plant, hiding in underground mazes and repelling Russian attacks. But cut off from the rest of the military, casualties kept mounting and living conditions became untenable. Kyiv finally ordered its soldiers to surrender after almost three months of fighting. Our scores of injured Ukrainians emerged from the factory, meeting their Russian captors. Moscow's victory at Mariupol gave it a land corridor that connected forces in southern Crimea to those in the eastern Donbass. In August, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky announced a full-scale counteroffensive to retake territory in the south. The key objective was Kherson, the first major city that fell to Russian occupation. The Ukrainian military moved at lightning speed. By early October, 2,400 square kilometers of territory was regained, most of it in just two weeks. Our Kyiv soldiers finally ended Kherson in November, ending Russia's seven-month hold on the city. Ukraine's success dealt a symbolic blow to Russia, for Kherson was the only regional capital that Moscow had managed to occupy. And then there's Bakhmut, where brutal attrition warfare has given it the moniker the meat grinder. Both Ukraine and Russia are suffering heavy losses trying to control the city. Ukrainian soldiers have reported Russian troops charging headlong into gunfire without care for casualties. For Moscow, taking Bakhmut is a key goal. It would allow them to cut off Ukrainian supply lines and advance deeper into Donetsk. But Ukrainian officials say Bakhmut is not of strategic importance to Kiev. Its military is holding out there to grind down Russia's soldiers and buy time for other counter-offensives. Oh, it's signs that Russia is preparing to pour a fresh wave of troops into this conflict. And with the West promising Ukraine more sophisticated weapons, Bakhmut is unlikely to be the final flashpoint in this war. And for more, we're joined by Michel Yakrolev. He's professor at the Paris School of International Affairs. He's also the, the former vice chief of staff to NATO's Supreme Headquarters, Allied Powers Europe. He joins us now from Paris. Uh, professor, we just heard that Bakhmut is unlikely to be a final flashpoint. We heard President Putin today saying, uh, essentially, Russia cannot be defeated on the battlefield. This war is... this is about, and I quote him, the very existence of our country. So Bakhmut is very small potatoes in this larger picture. Where do you think then we should be looking for the next crucial flashpoint in this almost one-year war? The next crucial flashpoint, uh, well, currently there is apparently a major Russian offensive along the line. So let's say the whole line in Donbass is a flashpoint. I also have a suspicion that um, uh, the Putin regime will have to try a gambit, uh, a major effort um, for symbolic victory that would turn the tables, that would show that the initiative is definitively in, in the Russian camp. And for me, that is not another Bakhmut or another city in the Donbass. It is trying another time for Kiev, not necessarily to capture it, but at least to encircle it or to start bombing it. I think that's a likely possibility for uh, the Russians. Otherwise, just pushing on in Donbass will get them to the further Bakhmut. Ultimately, so what? Well, if they try to take Kiev, I take it Ukraine is not going to be standing by idly. They might 
jump on that chance and, as you had proposed earlier as well, uh, try to defang the Russian army. We've heard uh, Mr Putin come out today to say that they are suspending participation in the New START treaty. That means uh, no longer taking part in bilateral limitations of nuclear warheads and possibly resuming nuclear tests. There's a lot of thought about what is a red line for Mr Putin. Could his attack on Kiev and then Ukraine re-attacking him as he attacks Kiev, could that be the red line that would trigger a nuclear move from Mr Putin? No, I don't see a nuclear move over Ukraine, period. Uh, it's not in Russian doctrine. It's, it is a regional battle. The red line is, um, is the Russian sanctuary, just like the NATO sanctuary is. And that means crossing with uh, ground troops, which will not happen. So I don't see a case for uh, a nuclear intervention into Ukraine. So not... Oh, pardon as me, for please start, continue. Yeah. Do continue, pardon yeah. me. As, as for start, yeah, uh, the... Uh, well, start has had stops and starts, and it was almost killed by President Trump until it was uh, reinvigorated by President Biden. The, um, the fact is that the, the, the Russians don't see much interest in confidence building measures today. And also talking of resuming um, um, nuclear tests, despite the nuclear test ban treaty that they have signed, well, first of all, it will just be another treaty that they, that they don't uh, uh, abide by. And secondarily, it means that to re renovate or upgrade their nuclear uh, armory, they need to go back to testing because their simulation model is ineffective. In essence, it's an admission of technological backwardness. They've Professor, got to go back to basics to test their new generation. All right, Professor, a final question here. A lot of uh, concern about who wins, who loses. But the truth is, even if Russia wins, uh, or in the case of Russia losing, uh, former Secretary of State Harry Kissinger has said, you are opening up an area of 11 time zones to internal conflict and outside intervention in which there are 15,000 and more nuclear weapons. But for you, in external conflict is less of an issue. If Even if Russia should win, the, to the, the poison that has been opened up because of this war, that's not something that will be easily dealt with. Final question. Indeed, the, um, this war has exposed the glaring ineptitude of the Putin regime and the fact that the country is crashing into a wall. And that was before the war for demographic, uh, structural, economic uh, and, and technological reasons. The war has accelerated the internal crumbling of the regime by a few years. And the war is a poison, an acid. I call it Ukrainium, just like polonium killed uh, Litvinenko, you know, the, uh, the, the dissident. Uh, President Putin has drunk a large glass of Ukrainian, and his regime is being sapped from inside. That's the way I see it. Oh, thank you. Michel Yakolev, professor at Paris School of International Affairs, joining us live from Paris.